inspire, connect, resource, growing healthy churches, is in relationship for God's mission. Well, welcome back, everybody. In a moment, we'll be asking uh, Rachel again to uh, engage with us. And I, I don't know about you, but I really found the session so far really thought provoking. Um, uh, but without further ado, um, let's welcome Rachel back. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. And thank you for the feedback in the, um, in the sidebar, the chat bar. Br brilliant comments. So insightful. Um, you know, you, it's so clear you understand your context. We, Jason and I have been doing church planting for the whole of six months before <laughs> um, lockdown started. So six months and then, and then three months lockdown. And uh, so we know nothing about anything, um, which is why we talk about it. <laughs> People who know nothing talk about it. Um, but I think one of the things that we've become very quickly aware of is as a leader, understanding your context is so key, isn't it? Like becoming an expert on the needs of your community. And it's so obvious from looking, reading the feedback, like you guys have got the finger on the pulse. It's just, it's really encouraging. Let me, uh, let me share the screen again. Get this going. Brilliant. Share. Um, here we go. Right, so the sweet spot then. So we, we've heard it said a lot, haven't we? The crisis like the pandemic, like COVID-19, is not just a disruptor, it's an accelerator. And I wonder what it's accelerating for you in your own discipleship, in your leadership. And, and maybe the, one of the reasons that you're on this Zoom today is mainly because you love each other. And that's so obvious watching you guys rock up on Zoom and welcome each other. But because actually maybe what's being accelerated for you is thinking around reaching the under 40s um, and particularly sort of the under 25s. Uh, so we've all been through um, a, a season of great adaption, haven't we? The fact that you're here on Zoom proves that you're a leader that can adapt actually quite frankly <laughs> um, and, and a nice definition of being able to adapt is we hadn't planned to do it at all or we hadn't planned to do it yet but we've done it so many of you have moved things online um, something you may have planned to do at some point but actually now you've done it we've adapted um, but innovation is different innovation often comes out of being able to adapt but it's but it is different so innovation is we don't need to do it, but we will. And, and innovation is harder because whereas when we adapt, we do it out of a sense of great emergency and it's do or die, innovation is, is more the ugly zone that I talked about earlier. It's, it's the thing that feels like a luxury. It's the, you know, the, 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 uh, your equivalent of PCC in the Baptist Union, which I think is, the, is whole church membership, isn't it, agreeing? Um, probably it wasn't difficult to get everyone to agree to do something online to stay connected. But in this next season of leading, it's going to be very difficult to get consensus around things that you want to innovate coming out of lockdown. Because actually what people want, probably particularly if we're, we're working with those in the old generations. Remember our graph about change is unsettling um, or they want full collaboration. So the expectation that things will change is not there. Um, they'll want things to go back to the comfort. And if you're saying, no, let's, there is no going back. <laughs> there is only moving forward safely and beautifully and well then that, that will be challenging. So, um, so really my, my phrase for you uh, in this is uh, pivot. How are you going to pivot? Pivot younger is my cry to you really. And I talked about earlier how one of the natural flows of the church is to skew older. I mean, left to itself, every church will just grow older. It just will, won't it? So if actually we want coming out of lockdown to be a church that really engages the under 40s, that will require energy, pivoting, turning the boat in the opposite direction. And our lovely bishop here, Bishop Jill Duff, she says things like, when you feel the overwhelming sense from a community or a church saying, no, that will never work here. <laughs> she says everything in our spirits should rise up and say, that's exactly why it's gonna work here. So it's not about us fighting congregations or fighting people, but it's about saying, often the things in the spirit that need to change are often faced with um, <clears throat> real barriers from those who would want to get on board. You know, when Mary uh, is uh, carrying 
the son of God. It's Joseph that wants to quietly divorce her. You know, it's not her worst enemy. It's the person closest to her. And often that is what happens, isn't it? As we sense what God is saying and we begin to live that out, often it's those closest to us who misunderstand the most. So just, I just want to kind of frame that really and recognize that the stuff I'm about to talk about is not easy. It's not easy to do. Um, so, uh, so I want to sort of talk to you a little bit about what it might mean to pivot younger and then I want to give us three key areas that we can uh, operate in to really engage emerging generations in, in evangelism and discipleship. So, so, so first of all, um, oh sorry, I haven't got these on the slide. Um, so pivoting younger, this means creating strategy and allocating significant resources to reach young people. Um, and I'm not going to be prescriptive of what that is, but it means allocating significant resources. So number one, the churches that do this, that pivot younger, they invest heavily in their youth, their young adults, their, their student ministry, not just in terms of staff, but it's about staff, but also in terms of theological innovation, that they don't sideline this part of the church to a bunch of professionals. And I think one of the challenges, and I'm going to be careful what I say now, because I am... A trained youth worker um, but I'm so old as a youth worker that I did all my training at Brighton University and Hastings local authority in the days before you could do a Christian degree in um, in, a, in youth ministry so my degree is in theology and then I took up some other stuff as well but I think one of the dangers is that we've slightly professionalized youth ministry and then we've outsourced it. And people that come into youth ministry are astonishing, incredible leaders. Um, but sometimes we expect them to be mature disciple makers, theological thinkers, amazing on safeguarding and governance, great at connecting with young people. So we tend to employ very young and then wonder why there's a disconnect with some of these other things. So I think investing heavily in youth ministry is actually your role as well as a leader to think theologically about connecting with younger generations and to think about all that kind of stuff. Number two, churches that pivot younger are very good at making younger people visible. Um, putting younger people on platforms, uh, making younger people visible in every area of church life and the decision making structures and employing younger staff, which doesn't mean that you fire older staff <laughs> or if you're over 40 like I am, that you think, oh, there's no room for me anymore. Not at all. But you recognise that actually you need to be demonstrating this is what we're doing and we're going to put younger people in more visible positions, not to set them up to fail and not to give them authority beyond the spiritual authority that God's given them or their skills, but to say, actually, we want young people to see young people when they walk into the church. We want them to see people that look like them in our church. Number three, churches that pivot younger um, acknowledge the context and the culture of young people in all their communication methods, their tone of things. So if you want to be reaching under 40s, I wonder what under 40s are connecting with. Are they married? Have they got kids? Are they at work? What's their workplace like? Are they at university? An illustration to unpack something. If all your illustrations are about your wife and your kids, that might be a brilliant communication method for some people, but you've probably missed out a whole load of people who are single, of any age actually, um, but particularly of younger people. Think about in your tone, in your communication, is this resonating uh, with uh, younger generations? Talking about Black Lives Matter, talking about COVID-19, talking about the latest thing on Netflix, not in a token gesture, but recognizing we want to make these communication bridges with people. Number four, churches that pivot younger, sometimes are more likely to engage in church planting and I'm part of a church planting network and I'm not sure how many of you have been involved with church planting I mean the church that you're leading was planted once wasn't it so we're all working in church planting context but sometimes actually what needs to happen is that churches congregations are planted with a real priority around a certain demographic this church is planted to specifically reach under 40s. We want people over 40 as part of the church, but you need to know that the mission that you're getting involved with is we want to be pivoting younger to reach younger generations, and we want you as part of that. We need your wisdom and your skills. Number five, churches that pivot younger make the mission of reaching emerging generations more important than their methods. 
And I think what I, what I mean by this is that the methods that we use is like building with scaffolding. So maybe on one particular housing estate, this particular method of messy church works. Maybe somewhere else, the method of a uniformed youth organization works. Maybe somewhere else, the method of Instagram services at 6 p.m. on Insta Live works. But they are less important than the mission. The mission is whatever we do is about reaching younger people. We don't really care how we do it. That can change regularly, but the mission doesn't change. And I think churches that do this well can can look on the outside like they're fairly um very fairly brutal but they, they will pass every decision along that very narrow track so if we're reaching under 40s should we have notice boards in church with bits of paper pinned to notice boards does that communicate with under 40s or when an under 40 year old walks into church and they just see a mess of papers stuck on notice boards and signs here and weird china and crockery and doilies and fl and plastic flowers does that communicate this is not your place so it's so it asks very hard questions of everything that is done under through that lens uh, number six Churches that pivot younger, they get ready for quick pivots, for regular experimentation, the ability to respond quickly to a rapidly changing culture. And at the moment, the voices coming out of the States are talking about church leaders that can pivot will be those that will have churches to lead into the future. And we can critique a lot that's coming out of the States at the moment. Um, it's a very different um, context there but if you want to see some interesting research the Barna B-A-R-N-A -A, Barna Research a guy called David Kinnaman who's a good friend of mine and um, he does some really interesting church in the states about how church attendance has changed dramatically so I was chatting with him at the beginning of lockdown he was saying the first few weeks of lockdown in the states they saw church attendance online drop like it plummeted it was almost like the demographic of nominal Christians said, phew, we haven't got to be at church anymore. Here's our chance to pull out. And I said, here, it's so different. Here, it skyrocketed. The first three weeks, everybody who could get hold of an iPhone or a laptop, even if it's like a little rural church where there's like one person <laughs> doing communion, suddenly 25% of the population were accessing church online. So it's a very different context, but there's some interesting things that come out. But of course, I hear you say, my friends, reaching younger generations or reaching anybody for that matter is not just about style and structure, of course. It's also about kind of the communication and the connection and, and what it is that we seek to do. So here are three vital areas to pay attention to, particularly reaching sort of the group that I work with, which is the under 25. So that's really what I'm zoning in on. Um, number one, encounter, encounter. In our culture today for young people, personal experience is the gateway to truth. So I think it's no surprise that we are seeing a renewed interest in spiritual encounter. At the back of Preston Minster, when we arrived um, nine months ago, there was a bunch of up to about 45 young adults aged 17, 18, 19, um, all dressed very grunge. I mean, they had to be wearing loads of clothes. This is the Northwest and they were sat in a graveyard and they were there every day, just, you know, littering the graveyard and smoking their fun stuff and chucking bottles of coke up onto the guttering of the church, the back of the church. And I think that the city hated them being there. We're, we're right at the heart of the city. So we, we planted, the, the press and minister, the congregation dwindled to a tiny congregation. They very graciously, um, it would have cost them a lot and hurt them a lot, but they very graciously agreed with the bishop to close down the minster. And they've gone to a different church that's accommodating their specific needs. And, and some of them have stuck with us, which we love. Um, but we are a church reaching under 40s. And so we saw this bunch of young adults and thought, we're not going to kick them off the graveyard. Like, we want to reach them. But they, they were not coming into church. They were not having it at all. And every time we, every day we walked up, they'd sort of smoke their cigarettes and look at us who's like slit eye, like their eyes like, oh, <laughs> what are you going to say to us today? And there was one particular day where they were chucking bottles of Coke up on the guttering. So I, I walked very purposely towards them and they slightly were like, uh-oh. And I said, are you chucking bottles of Coke up into the, into the roof? They said, yeah. I said, give me that bottle. 
So they gave me the bottle. I turned around. It was the most wonderful thing. And I threw the bottle of Coke up in the air and it landed upright in the gutter, which is what they were trying to do the whole time. And so suddenly I was like, that's what happened. I said, that's what happens when God's on your side. And then I walked off. And of course, that is not what happens when God's on your side, but it just felt like a really fun thing to say. So it began a, a relationship with them. And every day I'd hang out with them. I'd take them food. I'd allow them to come and use the toilet. Um, saying, what would it take to get you guys into the church? And, and what was interesting was the, the sole reason really that they said was that they were so convinced that they led such terrible lives. And many of these young people have been kicked out of care, kicked out of college, that their rejection they've experienced is immense. But their overwhelming reason for not coming into the church was they felt convinced that God was real. And if somehow they entered his holy place, he would zap them and kill them. I mean, massive. These are atheist, many of them, secular, nihilist, a little bit into the occult, young people who, who had an overwhelming sense that they would not be allowed into a church because God would hate that. Anyway, the day before lockdown, we were given huge numbers of black plastic bags filled with chocolate lint bunnies. And, uh, and they arrived. And the only people to help me unpack the cars and the vans were these young people or at the back of the minster. So I said to them, I totally respect your views. I disagree with your views. God will not zap you. I've also got huge amounts of chocolate that's got to come into the church so that we can feed the hungry. Please really help me. And dutifully, I think they're all slightly high as well, which probably helps. But dutifully, they all picked up big bags of chocolate and came into the church. And it broke my heart, really, because the day before we had to close the building and say, you can't come back, was the day that they all came into the building. And suddenly, these conversations about Jesus and God and spirituality just like they absolutely just exploded across the church I got my husband down to come and get involved with some and it made me think gosh in creating a space for young people to encounter God is crucial one of the most defining marks of young people in terms of their spiritual lives today is their spiritual illiteracy we can't rely on them knowing anything about what we mean when we say pray. Have you seen Russell Brand's little film on YouTube saying lots more people are Googling pray. I'm going to teach you how to pray. Where have our national leaders got on YouTube and created an amazing film saying, we know you want to connect with God. Let me teach you how to do it. Russell Brand's doing it. I don't know who he's teaching them to pray to, but Russell Brand's doing it. Like we've got to realize the space that we're in. And this is one of the greatest challenges for us in lockdown, I think, particularly as church leaders and youth workers. You can do the preaches via Zoom quite nicely. You can do discussions over Facebook Live. But how is the worshipping, the corporate worship been going? It's tough, isn't it? It's tough. We've really missed that encounter together. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of what I've discovered um, and what we've discovered at Youthscape. So interestingly, young people are missing encountering God together in worship, but they are having powerful encounters with God in their bedrooms at the moment, waiting on God. And the practice of contemplative prayer seems to be going slightly through the roof. I was leading our older youth at the Minster um, on a Zoom a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I said, We're now going to um, mute ourselves uh, and we're going to wait on God, and we're not going to come back on until we think God said something to us. So we waited and we waited and we waited. And then somebody unmuted themselves and shared something and somebody else unmuted themselves. And these are young people who are still on a journey of their faith. But in their bedrooms, they heard God speak to them and they shared stuff that was so incredibly profound and significant because they're hungry to connect with God. And we have young people contacting us saying, I don't know. I think I prayed to God for the first time. Are you guys Christians? Can you teach me more about Jesus? It's absolutely incredible. So we need to adopt a come and listen evangelism that says rather than come and we'll teach you the doctrines and teach you the stuff come come and experience come and listen come and encounter come and meet god i remember years ago running a a, a youth group uh for the local authority that their, their, their youth workers that for the local authority um were stopped working they had this youth group of all girls they wanted it to carry on they asked me at the local church would i run it i said yes but i'm a christian and i love jesus so i'd love to run this youth group but i'll be in the church and and we'll always give space for god to do stuff and they they were like yeah that's fine the girls are fine with that 
So every week we met, me and the other youth workers and these girls, not Christians, we would talk about everything, puberty, sexuality, relationships, identity, just do general sessions. We didn't really talk about Jesus a great deal. Then one evening, um, our worship band were in the next door room practicing and they'd put the lights down low and have some candles and just cushions on the floor. And the girls were saying, oh, can we go and listen? And I was like, no, I need to finish this amazing session on puberty. <laughs> and then realised what I just said. I was like, yeah, no, go, go and listen to this. So they all snuck through next door. And I said to the worship leader, just keep practising, keep doing it. And these girls just lay down all across the church in silence. And they just listened. And at the end, I noticed that most of them had been crying. They had no idea what it was but they encountered God. We need to create space for young people to encounter God. One of the most extraordinary things about Soul Survivor that's now finished, if ever you went to Soul Survivor festivals, there could be up to about 10,000 teenagers in, an, in a big top. Huge numbers. Think of all the pheromones flying, the hormones flying. And they could get crazy. Like it could be just off the scale outrageous. But at the end of someone preaching, often it'd be Michael and your Ali would stand up and say, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come now. And we don't whip God up. He comes down. And they would always hold a period of silence. 10,000 teenagers in silence encountering God. Extraordinary. So let's create spaces for young people to encounter God, to meet God. Uh, Oh, there, oh, there's my slide from earlier. I'm so sorry. I put it in the wrong place. There we go. There we go. Never mind. Number two. So three thoughts for you. Number, the first one is counter. Number two is choice. The art of practice. In our culture, personal experience, as I said, is the gateway to truth. So it's no surprise we're seeing a resurgence in spiritual experience and also in spiritual practices because this generation has to choose to believe in the way that previous generations were not so aware of. So for a young person, as I said earlier, to, to choose to be Christian, there is no supporting culture now that is developing their faith. They're not part of a society that says, oh, you're a Christian, that's great. They're not part of a peer group that says, oh, you sing in the choir, that's great. They're often not part of families that say, oh, you're a Christian, that's great. And so choosing to follow Jesus, for many of them, feels very early on a very um, personal choice that feels quite fragile. So being able to engage in the practices of Christian faith, I would say, is a prerequisite for this generation choosing Jesus. Taking on, trying on the practices of the way of Jesus is often the doorway to them exploring the person of Jesus. And, and years ago, when I was involved with the very first Romance Academy, our, the challenge that we were given was by the BBC, could you take 12 North London teenagers that are very sex obsessed, can you get them not to have sex and we will film it? So, we, so me and Dan are Christians. We created a program that looked a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous type thing. And we just said to 12 North London teenagers, we want to, to mentor you for five months to see if it's possible for teenagers to resist the pressure and culture to be sexually active early. So we weren't even saying don't have sex till marriage. We were just saying for five months, we want to coach you to help you resist the overwhelming pressure of culture to be sexually active because of all the negative implications of early sexual activity. So interestingly we never once opened our bibles the teenagers knew we were christians we never gave them an apologetic for a biblical sexual ethic but three of them at the end of the course out of 12 became christians just by asking can we follow jesus we didn't even say do you want to follow jesus three of them became christians because by experiencing a, a christian practice and receiving the benefits of that, like the feelings of worth and self-confidence and self-respect, that beautiful feeling that you can resist culture and it, and it feels great, like that introducing to want to know more about Jesus. So I'm a big fan of youth ministry that's about experiencing Christian practice. So, so we at Youthscape have done a huge bit of research called We Do God, and you can have a look at it, go on the Youthscape website. And I'm going to quickly talk you through the key findings of a bit of research we've done with youth workers and with young people in the church and outside the church about the benefits of this approach about practice. So number one, 
threshold experiences that help young people form habits of faith and to, 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 be, to deconvert them from a kind of a dead church kind of identity is crucial to them choosing a radical, faithful Christianity. So inviting young people, not saying first, are you a Christian, then you can pray. Say, let's sit together and uh, at the skate park, should we pray? Should we talk to God? And inviting people to get into the practice even before the belief. These are threshold experiences that introduce young people to Jesus. What's great about these kind of practices is it opens young people to the rich diversity in the body of Christ. So I was working um, in North London with a bunch of teenagers who were all part of just street gangs. Some of them were involved in criminal activity, not all, but they were all part of gangs. Um, mostly I didn't share skin colour or ethnicity with them. I didn't share background with them. There was lots about us that was very different in our upbringing. But these amazing young people were coming to faith in Jesus from the most awful backgrounds. And we realized very quickly that we wanted to introduce them to just how beautiful God's church is. So we would, we would um, rock up with minibuses, stick them in the back of the minibus and take them to visit different churches in the area. We took them to high churches. We took them to low churches. We took them to festivals, all sorts of places to give them a sense of, do you know what, following Jesus doesn't mean you do this in one way. doesn't mean you sing in one way. Sometimes you sing like this, sometimes you sing like that. And we watch these amazing teenagers who have dangerous lives on the streets, who people have written off. We saw some of them come alive in really quiet contemplative services. And we saw others of them come alive in really Pentecostal services. So the, the whole thing was come and explore what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. Number three, the beautiful thing about prioritizing Christian practice is that it's a commitment for us as adults to do that job of co-discipleship, that we journey alongside them, that we model the practices we want them to mimic. And so it's not just about us teaching the practices, but it's about young people seeing the difference that prayer makes in our lives. I'll never forget one amazing session that I led with young people where I'd been trying to say to them for weeks that, um, you know, talking to Jesus about everything and, and asking the Holy Spirit to give you self-control does make a difference. And, you know, it's possible in any situation where you feel tempted and overwhelmed, it's possible to choose a Jesus way. And they weren't getting it until I invited this 39 year old businessman from our church who spends most of his time on the road in really exotic hotels. And I said to him, can you just chat to these young people about your practice, your Christian practice? When you go away to these amazing hotels, you're away from your wife and kids, what are your spiritual practices? And he said this, my first spiritual practice is I ask, I switch off Wi-Fi and I ask for the television to be removed from the hotel room. And he's like, why man, why? And he's like, because I don't want to be watching any porn. I love my wife and I honor her and I know my weakness. I don't, and they, suddenly it clicked for these young people like, oh, this stuff, like it makes a difference. It's just so amazing, amazing. Number four about practices. Also, it's recognizing that for young people, before they de develop and adopt individual devotional practices, they develop corporate practices. So although we do talk to young people about praying on their own, reading the Bible on their own, all the rest of it, actually what they respond best to is corporate. We're all going to read through the Bible in a year. We're all going to do this. We're all going to give our money. We're all going to go and feed the homeless. It's a corporate, it's the tribe responding. And I think this leads to my last point in this section, and I'll wrap, wrap to the next one. But I think one of the most important things that we can do for this generation is create plausibility shelters. If you are 15 and you're at school and you don't know anybody that is a Christian, you need in your life plausibility shelters, places and spaces and people that help you try out what it means to be a Christian. What does it feel like to live for Jesus, to get things right and to get things wrong, to realise that actually as a Christian, we often learn through our mistakes. So youth ministry is not about teaching the doctrine, but it's about creating these plausibility shelters. What would you do in this scenario? What did I do in this scenario? How might Jesus want to live? What would it mean 
to live for Jesus today. So one of my big questions that I ask young people that I minister to here regularly, I ask them today, what will it mean for you to live for Jesus today? And what can I be praying for you? So today, how are you going to choose Jesus today? How, not, not like three months ago, I prayed that prayer that you became a Christian and we'll just rely on that. No, no, that, that's happened. You are a Christian, but I'm really interested today to know how I can help you to choose Jesus today. And that means that as leaders, no topic is off, off, off uh, agenda, is it? No topics to boot. Nothing, nothing is too difficult or dangerous for us to talk about because you want to help young people choose Jesus. And the, and the last one, I realise I'm rapidly running out of time, so I'll be super quick. The last one is challenge. So it's about encounter, opportunities for encountering God. The second is about choice. How do we help young people choose Jesus and the way of Jesus? And the third one is challenge, the call to surrendered discipleship. When I talk with young people about sex, and sexuality. I'm writing a book at the moment um, for youth leaders and parents about this. And I think at the heart of this is if it is surrender, surrendered sex, surrendered sexuality. I think this is an amazing opportunity for us in church to recapture the heart of discipleship because I think we've been having conversations for too long or expecting youth workers to be having conversations for too long that almost are kind of outside of that central call. You know, I don't expect a young person that's not chosen to follow Jesus to live up to a biblical sexual ethic. But I mean, I'm really eager for every young person to know that their bodies are made in a beautiful way and that there are things that they can do with their bodies that will hurt them and hurt others and things that they can do with their bodies that doesn't hurt them and doesn't hurt others. But what I want to be saying to young people who are choosing to follow Jesus is the way of surrender is the most dynamic way to live. That rather than the more you know about Christianity, the more oppressed this feels. No, the more you know about following Jesus and how surrendered he calls you to be, the more free you are. And that's what we need to recapture. Tony Campolo says this, we won't lose this generation to Christ because we made discipleship too difficult, but because we made it too easy. I remember a few years ago, I was preaching at a youth event um, and I, uh, the call at the end, I, I really wanted to call young people to a deep, yeah, a real deep surrender, a radical surrender to choose, to choose sexual purity and sexual um, fidelity, to not be sexually active um, as a single person, to say, actually, I don't know what my future relationships will be, but, but right at this moment, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be sexually active anybody. And I, and I said to the leaders, I don't want them to come forward tonight. I want them to wake up super early tomorrow at 5 a.m. and meet me on the beach. Because actually the, the kind of the will to do this, I, I want it to feel like this is not just an emotional response at the end of a service. I, it, this is a cold light of day discussion. We, but they didn't let me do that because the safeguarding was just a bit too tricky. But I think we can call this amazing generation to surrender to Jesus, knowing that their greatest driver is security. So recognizing, recognizing their deep desire for security, but also saying to them, you will never be as safe as you are when you are fully surrendered to God. There is obviously physical safety, emotional safety, and we need to create that space in our church. You know, safeguarding is not instead of the gospel, it is the gospel. But I think inviting young people to see that actually the life they were called to live, that is safe now and in the life to come, is the one that is completely surrendered. You'll never more yourself than when you're living a life fully surrendered to Christ and inspired by the Spirit. I'm going to end with this story and then we'll do discussions. Years ago, at the back of the Romance Academy, um, these wonderful 12 young people who are not Christians, not from a church background, we took them to um, America as part of the programme and uh, to visit a sexual abstinence programme. So it's very different to what we were doing, um, but they were Christians, we were Christians. And uh, our lovely young people on the Romance Academy, 12 boys, uh, six boys, six girls, got to stay with Christian families in Florida. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd really met a community of Christians. They'd, they'd known me and Dan from doing this once a week course sort of thing, but they'd never really met Christians really. And, uh, and they stayed, so we put them in pairs in these lovely Florida Christian family homes, these, these characters that were larger than life. I mean, it was just hilarious. 
and the love that these these florida christians showered on these north london unchurched quite quite challenging young people was extraordinary um and on the plane on the way back one of the the teenage girls who was 16 had been in and out of care all her life she sat next to me on the plane and and uh and, and she had been with a super conservative Christian family that, you know, they, they laid it on the line about drinking and smoking and all the rest of it. And I was be like, oh, no. Oh no. Um, anyway, on the plane the way back, this teenage girl said to me, did, did they love me? Um, and were they nice to me because they're Christians? And I said, well, people can be loving and wonderful who aren't Christians. But yeah, they, they do. They do love Jesus. And that, that's, that changes how they love people. And she said well are there christians like that in north london and i was thinking well i'm uh, yeah me for a start <laughs> and i said yes there are, there are lots of christians like that in north london and she said great i'm i'm gonna go and find some i'm gonna go to my local church and she she told me she explained where it was and i suddenly remembered that her local church where she was living in her hostel her local church was a little um brethren chapel that um there was never any sign of life really midweek and i think on a sunday morning they have about five people and, and nobody was under the age of 200 like that that sort of church and i was like oh no this is disastrous like her one chance of meeting god's people it's gonna completely fail so i said to my husband we have got to kidnap her and take her to soul survivor in watford in like 20 minutes away and my husband said rachel you cannot body block teenagers meeting christians <laughs> you're not allowed to do it just let her go to the local church trust that god is bigger than your strategy so i was like Ooh. so i let i was like okay all right so all morning sunday morning i was praying like oh lord please will, you, will she get on the wrong bus and end up in a really cool church <laughs> um and at lunchtime i popped around to her hostel and i said oh how, how did you get on did you go to church she said oh yeah i went and she went to the brethren chapel I said, how was it? She said, well, there was this woman on the front door. She wore a hat. Like, what was that all about? Um, and she gave me loads of books <laughs> for the service. Um, and then she sat with me and uh, she just sat at me for the service. Didn't really understand it. Um, they gave me some really nice drink afterwards. And yeah, it's all right. It was okay. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I, I was expecting her to say, it was awful. They were all really old. It was the worst thing ever. And she just came back saying, yeah, it's fine. It was nice. They liked, I, I liked them. And, and it was, the, the jolt in my heart was that the amazing thing was that, that this particular young person had a certain tattoo showing that she belonged to a certain tribe group. And she wore a, a cravat in a certain way, her sort of neck scarf. Which, and and had, had it been a church with youth ministry ironically she might have gone to a fight with other teenagers you, you don't know do you god sent her to the church where everyone was so old they just saw a living body <laughs> they saw somebody with a pulse and they just did what they knew jesus wanted them to do they just loved her and they cared for her and they gave her drinks and this old lady in her 80s just sat next to her for the whole service and i told that story about a year later we this lovely teenager didn't go back there we actually got her into a church where she could be discipled really well by a loving team of youth workers who were dedicated to her and, and that's what she needed but god knew that the first experience of his body needed to be a bunch of old people that would just love and and i get really choked showing that story and I, I i told that story a year later to a wi group in north london in that area and the lady on the front row began to cry and she was the woman on the door that welcomed this teenager and she remembered because they've, they've never seen the teenager before or since and I, and I said to her afterwards god sent you one of the most broken and wounded and challenging young people that i've worked with because he just knew that you would help her encounter love and Jesus. So I don't say that to undo everything I've said, not at all. Because actually this teenager couldn't stay there. They had to be somewhere where they could be nurtured and discipled. But I think sometimes the enemy would say to us, so the answer to all of this generational crisis stuff and all this culture crisis stuff is to somehow separate everybody off and put people into bubbles like we were hearing earlier. But God's answer to loneliness is not marriage it's the body of christ and god's answer to reaching emerging generations is not professionalized youth ministry but it's the body of christ who have a specific heart god's heart to reach emerging 
generations. And I pray that as you just discuss now, that God will just enlighten your thinking and, and help you to see not the church that you wish you were leading. If, and if only I had X, Y, and Z, I could do this. But that he will enable to, you to see the treasures and, and, the, and the riches that you have in the community that you already lead. That in leading with his spirit, you could call out of them something more robust than they ever think they have to reach this generation. So here are some questions for you, my lovely friends. Some churches seem to have real appeal to the emerging generations. Why do we think this is? Don't get too cynical, but you could do if you want to. Number two, <laughs> emerging from lockdown, what one thing would you like to see the church stop doing? Plastic flowers. <laughs> what one thing would you like to see the church start? And then number three, how could your church pivot younger to reach and disciple emerging generations god has called you to this church at such a time as this he knows god knows who he has in you and what he has in you so enjoy discussing this in your group and then we'll come back and have a bit of a q a and you can send me all your best questions for the q a inspire connect resource growing healthy churches in relationship for god's mission